of meeting notes, but it will be subject to the Public Information Act. I will turn it over here to Stephanie Rubin to call the meeting to order. So good morning, everybody. It's 11 o'clock, uh, time to begin the Texas Early Learning Council meeting. So hopefully you're in the right place not supposed to be at another council meeting and want to talk about early childhood. So welcome everybody. Um, I, uh, I'm excited to get us going. So we have some new members and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a, meet, in a minute. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Stephanie. I'm the director of Texans Care for Children. And um, I want to welcome, we do have two new members. Um, and we also have some uh, staff who, from agencies who've really stepped up to get this meeting going and organized. So first of all, I really want to thank them. Uh, so special thanks to Shay and Gabby and Reagan and Sarah and others who've uh, jumped in to help prepare us for this meeting. Um, and let's see, so I also want to welcome the public. Uh, if folks have joined and they may come in a little bit later, definitely encourage public participation. Um, today we are obviously, uh, this is a WebEx event and uh, folks can participate, but you know, please mute yourself when, uh, when you're not talking. Um, and uh, I think the host can mute you too. So uh, if there's background noise or, or dogs or another phone call or something, just please mute yourself so we can hear each other. Um, let's see. You know, we, uh, if folks uh, hopefully are, have joined by other links for the public and, uh, and hopefully people were able to find those. Uh, the opportunity to submit public comment is closed now, um, but uh, you can still provide, uh, sub, you know, written submissions if you're not able to give verbal uh, public comment today. So um, a reminder, besides the muting, to when you speak, just so we can have a good record, um, please, you know, say your name uh, and uh, so people can keep track. And um, I really want to thank everybody. I know this is a tough time and uh, we, there wasn't a huge amount of notice for uh, members and, you know, it was a few weeks to, as a reminder that this meeting was happening. So thanks everybody for participating. And um, I do want to acknowledge, uh, you know, that Lauren Zabinski has moved to North Carolina for a great job. And I just want to thank Shay Everett uh, for stepping up to kind of be the host and facilitator uh, with me of today's meeting. So I'm going to turn it over to Shay, who, whom you all know. She's a senior advisor um, for child care and early learning at TWC. And she is the... Uh, kind of in charge of all the logistics and mechanics for today and it's going to help me facilitate. So Shay, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We're going to conduct roll call now. I will state each member's name. Please respond by saying here or present. If you are a new member and this is your, wow. That sounded like one of my children's toys whose battery I remove. As soon as I hear that, I don't know what that was, but um, so I don't know if that was Shay's uh, sound, but we're going to um, do roll call and, um, and and then we have a couple of members and we'll have them introduce themselves. And I think hopefully everybody has, has seen bios for everybody else. So Shay, are you back on? Okay, well, I can do that. So, um, well, she has the list. So why don't we just at least start with our two new members to introduce themselves, and then we'll do an official roll call. Does that sound good, Amber and then Kim? Sounds great. Um, good morning, everyone. Amber Scanlon. I'm so glad to be with all of you today and really looking forward to being a part of this council. Um, again, my name is Amber. I'm Senior Vice President and Director of Client and Community Relations for PNC Bank. My office is based in Dallas, um, although we serve the broader North Texas 
um, and, and we have a, a separate counterpart in Houston, and we're growing ever more. And I, I live in South Lake, and in my role, I work very frequently with our early childhood education community, um, as that work is one of our primary philanthropic focuses at PNC. It's work I've been doing for 11 years, and um, know a lot of people in this group, and have the the honor of working with them quite frequently. So thanks for having me, and I look forward to it. I'm Kim. And everyone, uh, Kim Coffrin. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Texas Association for the Education of Young Children. I know many of you on the call. I've been with the association um, for just over six years now. Um, but before that, I have been in the early childhood space um, for longer than I want to say a number two, um, but have been in uh, uh, the direct care working for a, a uh, different roles in child care as far as teachers and directors, uh, education specialists, and managed a multi-site, um, uh, uh, worked for a multi-site organization um, here in Texas. So, um, so thrilled to be here and thrilled to, um, to continue to work with all of you. All right, Stephanie, thank you for stepping in there and welcoming mm -hmm. the new members to the team. I'm in a hotel room and they decided to do a county mandated fire drill. Um, but I think it's all good now. Um, so let's go ahead with the roll call, the formal roll call, um, if each member can respond. Well, let me back up. Did we get all of the uh, new members um, introduced? We did. Okay, thank you. If each member can respond by saying here or present after I state your name, that would be wonderful. So Catherine Abba. We can't, uh, you might be muted. Oh, did you hear? You said here, yeah. Thank you. Um, Chelsea Holden on behalf of First Lady Cecilia Abbott. Thank you. Sarah Abraham. Sarah Abraham. I She's looking for the mute button. <laughs> you want to raise your hand? Okay. Here. Yay. <laughs> Travis Armstrong. I believe he's joining late. Weldon Beard. I have not yet seen him. Terry Breeden. Here. Thank you. April Crawford. Here. Alferma Giles. I've unmuted you, Alferma. She said here. Melissa, Melissa yeah. Horton. I'm here. Becky Huskeeler. Becky Huskeeler. Yeah, I here. I can't. I thank we're, you. Yeah. Now we hear you. Thank you. Kim Coffrin. I am here. Jerlisa McDonald. Dana McGrath. Reagan Miller. Here. Dana's here. She was just uh, quiet, muted. So she's here. Thank you. Julie Richards. Here. Teresa Robledo. I'm here. Stephanie Rubin. Here. Amber Scanlon. Kirsten Sorry, Schwab. Here. June Yeatman. Jay, I think you skipped me. It's Kirsten Schwab. I'm here. Perfect. 
And I don't believe I have not seen June Eatman join and Audrey Young. Here. A quorum is met and I will pass it back to Ms. Rubin. So thank you. Um, let's see, what are we doing now? Are we, I guess, are we doing public comment? Does that sound right? Uh, we're at so, the um, first of July meeting minutes and then public oh, comment. So if the members will locate the draft July 2020 meeting minutes that oh, yes. were emailed to you earlier and also attached to the meeting maker sent out. And then Stephanie, do you want to call for any edit changes and then request a motion to approve? Yes. If everyone's had a chance to review. Does anybody have any edits or revisions to it? And if not, then is there a motion to approve the draft July 2020 meeting minutes? I'll make a motion to approve that. That's Kathy Abbott. Yep. And is there a second? <laughs> Thank you, Alfirma, for the second. So um, if there's no more discussion, I will turn it to Shay to get us the vote. Okay, yes. If no discussion, then I am conducting a roll call vote to approve the July 2020 draft meeting minutes. After I say your full name, please reply for, against, or abstain. Catherine Abba. For. Chelsea Holden on behalf of First Lady Cecilia Abbott. For. Sarah Abraham. For, got it. Uh, Travis Armstrong. who has just joined us. Welcome, Travis. I have made you a panelist. We are asking uh, if for folks to vote for, against, or abstain for the July, approval of the July 2020 meeting minutes. We'll come back to you. Oh. Hey, Travis. I, I'm sorry, go. I'm tardy today. Would you like to submit a vote for, oh. against, or abstain to I'm approve sorry. the meeting minutes? I vote for. Thank you. Uh, Weldon Beard is absent. Terry Breeden. Black. April Crawford. Four. Alferma Giles. Four. Melissa Horton. Four. Becky Huskeeler. Four. Kim Coffrin. Um, Jerlisa McDonald. Four. Dana McGrath. Megan Miller. Four. Julie Richards. Four. Teresa Robledo. Four. Bethany Rubin. Amber Scanlon. Four. Kirsten Schwab. Four. June Yeatman is absent. And Audrey Young. Four. The motion to approve the July 2020 minute has carried and I will turn the meeting back to Stephanie, though this is the time for public comment if you would like me to just move forward with that. Session. Sure, go ahead. That sounds good. All right. We have had one registration for public comment. 
it is a written comment, and I will read the written comment provided by Jessica Trudeau, the Director of Strategic Initiatives at TextProtects, located in Dallas, Texas. The time after a baby's birth is especially vulnerable for every family. Up to 94% of families have at least one nurse-identified risk or need postpartum, yet there is not a universal system of care to support families with newborns and children birthed to age five. Until a child enters school, families must navigate a complex landscape of disconnected services to survive and thrive, and this is particularly true in our new context with COVID-19, resulting in missed well-child appointments and immunizations, decrease in mothers receiving postpartum care, and lack of access to quality child care. Leveraging the medical system is perhaps the strongest single point of entry to connect families with young children to ensure a strong start. Family Connects is one part of the solution. Family Connects is an evidence-based program that coordinates care and aligns resources. After giving birth and prior to discharge, a nurse home visit is offered to all families in a community within a defined and targeted catchment area to assess family health and well-being at approximately three weeks postpartum. Research indicates, and local programming has verified, an 85% uptake on participation. Based on screening and the nurse's risk assessment, two additional visits may be provided. The nurse will focus on connecting the mother and children to each community's existing grid of resources and strengthen collaboration amongst community providers. Also, data gathered provides surveillance of needed, needed versus available resources within each community. Some of the most leveraged and utilized referrals include additional screenings for developmental delays through ECI, referrals to quality child care and other childhood systems and longer term supports such as home visiting through existing early childhood systems in Texas across core state agencies, including Texas Home Visiting, Early Childhood Intervention, Head Start, Early Head Start, and Help Me Grow. In addition to connection to resources, Family Connects has demonstrated the following results through two randomized controlled trials. Mothers who receive a Family Connects visit were 28% less likely to report possible clinical anxiety at infant age of six months, Mothers who reported an increased use of positive parenting behaviors and were more responsive to their baby at age six months. Mothers who were more likely to complete their six-week postpartum health check. A reduction of the total child maltreatment investigations among participants by 44% through age two. A reduction of the total child emergency room visits and hospital overnights by 50% through age 12 months and 37% through age two years. In 2019, Family Connects was offered to 1,239 families in Tarrant, Bastrop, Bear, Travis, and Victoria counties. Dallas County programming will initiate in spring 2021. Due to the aforementioned results and a return on investment of Family Connects indicated, indicated at $3.17 reduction in total hospital billing costs for every $1 in program costs. TextProtects is advocating for expansion of the programming. That concludes any public comment or requests for public comment submitted at this point, and I will turn it back over to Stephanie Rubin. Thank you to the public for your comments. Yes, I appreciate those, and, uh, you know, we will be talking about community actions today, so those were, that was a timely testimony, so thanks to Jessica and Text Protect for that. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about transitions. Normally, we think of transitions as, you know, child care to pre-K, ECI to something else, but we're talking about transitions in leadership and staffing, and, um, so, uh, first of all, I wanted to, uh, you know, obviously we are operating without a chair, an official chair right now, and I did want to uh, mention that um, it's my understanding that there is a process underway to appoint a new chair. Correct me if I'm wrong, but a new chair has not been appointed yet. Is that correct, Shay? Yes, that's correct. We okay, have to have a new chair by the next meeting, I believe. Okay. 
Are there any questions about about that process? Okay, that 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 uh, the chair will be appointed uh, by the governor's office. So we know they're uh, in in process of uh, thinking that through, which is wonderful. So um, and and then there is the um, transition of the role which Shea has stepped into for the purpose of the meeting, the interagency deputy director for early childhood. Um, and I will turn it over to um, Monica Martinez from TEA to talk a little bit about uh, that position and, and the transition and, and process for, for finding a new leader. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. And my apologies. Um, we have a lot of construction going on here um, at the TEA offices, so I'm sorry if it's a little loud. Um, did want to share with everyone that um, while we were um, incredibly disappointed um, to see Lauren leave, um, she was an absolute treasure for the time that we had her. Um, she's moved on to a, a great opportunity. Uh, but we recognize the importance of trying to get her role filled as quickly as possible. Um, and so we have posted the position. Um, the Texas Education Agency is taking the lead on um, posting the position and the um, four agencies are collaborating to um, recruit and try and get that position filled as quickly as we can. We have already scheduled some time um, and it is our hope that we will be able to conduct interviews in early December. Um, we would love to have um, someone in place by the, the start of the calendar year and, and certainly um, in time to provide support uh, across agencies as we move into the 87th legislative session. Um, so I would just say if, if you know of, of anyone who is talented and who might be interested, um, we can uh, get the, the link to the posting to you through Shea, um, and we would appreciate you spreading the word that that position is, is posted. Thank you, Monica. And is there anything, um, it sounds like it's the, the job description is pretty similar to how Lauren operated, kind of a, a you know, a, a staff in some ways and a coordinator to multiple agencies. And um, does that sound like, it, is it pretty much going to be the same scope? Um, yeah, that, that's correct. Um, so the, the position is one that is shared among the four agencies. Uh, we have made a few minor updates to the the posting um, to, I think, better reflect how the position evolved while Lauren was in the role. Um, but it, it is our intent that that continues to be a, a shared role, and and we're we're continuing to work on um, some of that coordination. But definitely making sure that we have um, one point of contact who is um, is carefully communicating with the leadership um, in early childhood at all four agencies. Great, thank you. And beyond, okay. really. <laughs> yeah, are there any other questions for Monica about that? And again, thank you for Shay. Thank you to Shay for stepping in in this process. Um, anything else from the council on that, on transitions? Okay, great. So um, we were gonna have a Scott uh, from TEA give us an up update um, on the Texas Early Learning Council website. I think Shay is going to step in and do that too. So Shay. Yes. Let me go ahead and share a document. Give me one second. Not that document. Okay, so this is okay. The update on the preschool development grant. I don't need to share a document yet. I will when we get to the next agenda item. So the preschool development grant, birth through five, provided an opportunity to advance interagency collaboration in the early childhood space. The original grant timeline ended in December 2019, but due in large part to the negative impacts of the COVID pandemic on this work, 
multiple no-cost extensions were granted. The current end of grant period is December 30th, 2020. Several of the key projects within the grant, including the statewide needs assessment and strategic plan were completed. A few of the ongoing projects include the exploration of coordinated eligibility verification and enrollment system, updating the Act Early Texas website, which provides access to and support of free developmental screeners for families, and building of local systems capacity by DSPS and clear impact in targeted cities. Upon completion of the grant period, a summary report will be created that provides information on all of the projects that make up the preschool development grant birth through five. If you have any specific questions in the meantime, please feel free to contact Scott Bodner from the Early Childhood Education Division at the Texas Education Agency. His email address is scott, S-C-O-T-T dot Bodner, B-O-D-N-A-R at T-E-A dot Texas dot gov. And if anyone needs that in writing, I have, uh, you know, my email address is connected to this public meeting announcement and I'm happy to send it to anyone. Um, so that concludes an update of the preschool development grant. Are there any need for discussion of this item? Or questions to the folks have? Shay, this is Kirsten. I have a question. Um, will we consider applying again um, for the um, grant that, I know this was a planning grant. Um, is there another cycle we'll, where we have an opportunity to apply again? So I believe Monica is no longer joined to answer this. I do see Scott on, if I can unmute you, Scott, do you have an update? Have you heard of a preschool development grant, um, another one in the future? I don't know of any plans for future iterations. We had applied for the follow-up, which was the next sort of step within the process. Um, after the initial period was ending and we were not one of the recipients for that. So it was essentially to take the plans that were created during the first planning grant and bring them to fruition to a greater extent. We, we did not receive that grant. So I don't know what their long-term plans are, but we don't have anything on the horizon at the moment. Just to, um, if I could follow up, my colleagues and I know my colleagues in Idaho have been in the process of applying. So, just wonder if somebody could research that and see if there's an opportunity for Texas to apply again. Of course. I'll make note of that. So, and uh, this is Stephanie. I was going to ask about the website, Scott, since you're on. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's basic, and there's a lot of inf great information in the needs assessment, of course. So I was just wondering if um, there are plans to build it out at all, to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, highlight efforts that are happening at the state level or feature some data that's driving the council or, uh, you know, things that are driving state agency actions or, or anything like that. Are there other plans for, I don't know, a more interactive website, for example? Sure. Well, the, the current website is essentially a, a straightforward HTML site. There isn't a whole lot of functionality baked in. That being said, the if the council has specific um, requests for different content types or different things that you want to feature, we absolutely can can add to the site, add new sections, add whatever content is necessary or whatever content really drives or helps advance the work of, of the council. So it, it's something that I can turn around very quickly if you have something specific in mind. But as, as of right now, there aren't any plans in place. I just try to update it as information comes in. But if there's yeah. if there's a desire to elaborate on what's there to build out some more things, then I'm, I absolutely can do that. Do people have any suggestions about what would be? I mean, one thought is each of the agencies um, in the early childhood related departments have uh, websites or um, you know, there's obviously a lot on, on uh, HHSC's website and TWC. Do we want to do we want to link to anything so people can come to the 
Early Learning Council website and then kind of navigate to the other, you know, data system sites or kind of public facing, you know, DFPS has great public facing, um, you know, web pages, just a question about whether we want it to, uh, you know, people who come to the website to get directed to some other great information the state's already invested in. Yeah, we absolutely can do that. Um, it's, it's like I said, it's very straightforward and we have a lot of flexibility with respect to the content. So if there are specific asks, by all means, send them my way and I'll get them integrated as quickly as I can. So Stephanie, this is Reagan. I, I think that's a good idea. I think that perhaps once we get um, a new quad agency position yeah. identified, I think that would be a great project to start working on. And I think we should sort of noted in the in the list of upcoming to do's. Okay. That sounds good. Good point. This is Audrey. I think we can also work to do it both ways on our agency websites linked back to the Texas Early Learning Council. I know we currently don't have that link up right now, but we can work to make that happen. And I guess it's also a question for the council. Do we want a website that has, it would require more, more staffing of it, but, you know, updates of some sort. Like, do, do we not want to really draw people to the website and instead draw them, you know, to agencies who, you know, have staffing to, to do that? Or do we want people to go to it? And, you know, maybe occasionally there's something, this could also be something the quad agency person does, is sort of figure out what the, monthly updates might be that could get posted there. It's just sort of a question about whether we want an, a real audience for this website um, or not. Because then it has to be populated occasionally so people go there. And maybe we can have a process, as Reagan suggests, when the new interagency person comes to have kind of a facilitated discussion, discussion about what that could look like, what's worth the effort. And maybe, we could share, maybe we could share some from some other states so people could see a little bit of, um, you know, how some uh, similar states have done it. Stephanie, I was going to add that it, it should be possible to integrate some automated feeds as well if there are some specific streams of information you think would be beneficial for people to see. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. Any other comment about the website or questions about the PDG? Um, does um, Do we have like a Twitter page or a social media presence for the Texas Early Learning Council that could be fed into the Early Learning um, website? Because a lot of um, practitioners are on social media and that's how they get a lot of information. And maybe if we have like a social media presence, um, they can, you know, be directly directed straight to the website from there as well. I do believe there was a Twitter account from the previous iteration of the council that I believe in April you might be able to jump in and help me out here. I think CLI was the one who owned that, and I don't know that if we transferred that over or not, but that's that's another possibility that we could certainly tie in. Scott, specifically, what are you referencing to transfer over? <clears throat> I believe there was a, a Twitter account that was associated with the, the Texas Early Learning Council in the past, the previous iteration, and I but I am not sure who runs that or who owns that. Okay, I can ask. Okay, great. That's all. Any other questions or comments for Scott? This is Reagan. Um, to Jerlita's point, I would just want to make sure that we have a clear process for understanding who manages Twitter content, who, who actually signs off on social media posts on behalf of the council. For sure. Yes. I mean, there could also be a hashtag, too, that's just if people want other members who care about Texas early childhood, you know, that's obviously something anybody could use and nobody, that's it's a little bit less uh, 
you know, that's not regulated, but people can send things, you know, so, so that folks can notice them um, and, and give feedback. That's just another yeah. social media option. I, I like that option versus having sort of a dedicated Twitter account because I, I do agree that then it becomes a more complicated approval process in terms of what goes out. So um, that makes sense to me. Just to kind of, I, I understand what you guys are saying now, maybe there isn't a need to have like Twitter, but Twitter and Facebook accounts were both closed. UT could reopen them and then transfer them. If, if that's desired, we can certainly do that. Okay, great, thank you. Any other um, comments or questions for Scott on this, on this point? And the other thing I would just say is this, you know, that our state uh, partners and our community partners are producing great research um, you know, the performance reports and other things that are legislatively required or federally required, you know, that those could be things that, uh, you know, turn into kind of an updated newsletter. But again, that might be for the new interagency director. But it would be, it would be, I think, great to show, to have the Early Learning Council be a uh, kind of a forum to show the cross-agency, cross-system uh, efforts that are in alignment and happening rather than going to each of the agencies to figure that out. So that's my two cents. Um, okay, so if there's um, no other comments, we can move to the next agenda item, um, which is, let's see. We are gonna talk about um, the strategic plan, if I have that right, Shay, and the survey that you all took. Um, so thank you for that effort, and I will turn it back to Shay. Yes, and let me just announce for the record that we have had uh, members Weldon Beard and June Yeatman join us, so welcome to you both. Let me go ahead and share a document that Reagan Miller put together. So the background on this survey was to take some all of the items from goal five of the strategic plan to see what would make sense for the Texas Early Learning Council to, um, to perhaps focus on and prioritize as initiatives of the council. So these are the items that came rose to the top. Thank you to everyone who completed the survey. Reagan, since you did the analysis, do you want to kind of walk through the um, methodology for each of these columns here? Sure, you bet. So, um, first of all, I want to thank Dana and, and her team because they actually went through all of the responses and they put together an analysis, which is on the left-hand side, called non-weighted results. So, Dana, please jump in if I say any of this incorrectly, but they went through and looked to see how many people identified issues either as their top priority, second, third, fourth, or fifth priority. And so the non-weighted results are an indication of which of these um, state strategic plan activities um, were the most voted on in total. I took the results and then I applied the weighting factor. So those that were rated number one got five points, et cetera, et cetera. And I calculated the, the weighted analysis to see which of these, um, if we had similarities across both of these methodologies. And so what you'll see is that um, the second strategy, the fourth strategy, and the ninth strategy from within the strategic plan rise to the top when you look both at the non-weighted results and at the weighted results. Uh, we have a few others that appear, um, and you'll see those on the screen. 8, 17, 1, and 3 also rose to the top, um, depending upon which methodology you looked at. Um, so when we sent out this survey, I believe the thought was to, to try to determine if there were 
specific strategies within this portion, within category, is this category five, the, the community portion of the strategic plan, that the Early Learning Council had a significant interest in and potentially wanted to have some level of focus on. Um, I think one of the challenges we identified was that because this council only meets every other month, we wanted to think about those strategies that the council might have an appropriate sort of time commitment to be able to consider, to provide input on, and to think about. And Reagan, when you um, talk about uh, next steps and things that the council could do, are you thinking, you know, should, should members be thinking about this in sort of a one year time frame? Um, or, you know, think about, you know, think about work that could happen in a few years? Do you have a sense of, uh, you know, and I ask that because it's sort of a question about whether we should whether one lens through which we could look at these options is COVID and what families, you know, and kids urgently need versus, uh, you know, and whatever needs they have have been probably needs for a long time and are just exacerbated by COVID. But I just wonder in, in sort of a time frame if, if that might help people think about what, what the priorities for the council should be. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's a question for the council. I think that I, I think it would be interesting for us to have, a, to have a discussion about these to see if those that are identified on both sides are the areas that you think you are interested in discussing, and then we could have some some conversation about you know what what does that look like uh -huh. given that this council meets every other month. Where might the council provide some value in how we strategize to to, to work on these? Okay, so the first question is, uh, if you look at the ones that got the most support, uh, do those, as you look at those, do those still feel very salient to you? Do those feel like um, that makes sense for the council to prioritize those? And then we can talk about what, what it means to prioritize them. I think that's a full discussion in and of itself. Any comments? I know Shay, people may not be able. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Shay. This is Kim. For those of us um, who haven't memorized all these um, uh, points yet, is there? A, I mean, I know you got just the recap here. Is there somewhere we can go to see the the full sentence of these? As we. Yeah. Yes, that's what I was going to maybe bring up to folks, or either read. Um, let me pull up another document if that's helpful. So, and for the new members too, Kim, you might have been in the audience, but we, you remember in, in our previous pre-COVID life, we went through to create <laughs> this document through things on the wall and right. we came up with these priorities, right? So, uh, and obviously there is, there's a combination of things that are about access, and uh, scaling things up, just focus on quality, and a lot of good questions around alignment and coordination. Because uh, we know communities are different and doing a whole range of really interesting, innovative things. Okay. So as you went through the survey and answered them, whether you're looking at the document or not, what? What what rose you know when you picked your top choices why why did you do that anybody wants to comment on that question Stephanie could I back up and just ask um, I might have just missed this how yeah. did we land on five as like the area to drill down into first the community on the community on the community piece yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, April. And I think, um, and Reagan and she can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the thought was uh, we have full-time, hardworking, dedicated, you know, state agency leadership um, and staff who are moving forward on a range of the um, other strategic plan items where the state is the lead. And that, you know, in other meetings, they've given us updates about their progress. And I think the feeling among the 
uh, you know, those of us who were planning the meeting was that this community piece had had not gotten enough attention and or had not gotten enough input from the council since we first came up with a strategic plan about what's happening. You know, many of the council members are, uh, you know, very active in their communities, in coalitions, you know, leading many of these efforts. And so part of it was about to kind of elevate what folks are doing and finding out who's, who's uh, working very intensely in their community on some of these issues. And then to help the council think about how do we then get state efforts to align with those or to support them. You know, if there are really good initiatives that are producing results, what else could the state do to, you know, align or support those efforts? That's how I was thinking about it a little bit. Um, and Reagan and Shay, does that comport with your thinking? It does. It does. And, um, I think you said it really well. A lot of a lot of the um, the other goals had activities that really that really seemed I don't want to say easy, but they seemed to to easily cross to um, to a state agency activity to, to something that 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 we could take action on. I think the community efforts. Um, I think perhaps we struggle a little more with those, and and how as a system we want to have an impact on um on that goal five about about the community having a coordinated system i also just um kim i put a link to the early learning strategic plan in the chat and that's where all of the details about these different um activities are listed and so if you guys if you guys go to the strategic plan, you can you can always look at all of the detail within that as well. Yeah, thanks, Regan. I I actually have it printed out in front of me, so I have to do my to do my homework a little bit at least. <laughs> so now they should all be up on the screen for you to look at and see which shook out so that in terms helpful. of either weighted or non-weighted. Yeah. So I know we said there are kind of two things we need to talk about. One is how do we feel reflecting on the non-weighted weighted priorities, but I think it's hard to reflect on that before we've talked a little bit about what it is we would do about these uh -huh. priorities of council members. Um, I mean, I'm trying to, I, I think what I'm trying to understand is would our role as council members be um, to sort of share our own perspectives if we have experience in these areas? Would it be to go back to our communities that we work in and, and sort of gather? Yeah, that's a, we can, we can tackle that. I think that's a fair question because it could be a combination of do we need more information and who do we, you know, if this is a priority, who do we then get it from? You know, whether it's presentations or submissions or, uh, you know, early learning council uh, backbone staff share out information to the council. Um, it could also be, um, you know, examples of uh, things that are pilots, you know, that could be scaled up. It could be, you know, in some cases here, we're talking about access, you know, the first one had, I think, exp you know, expanding to serve more families. And I think, as you know, in some programs, the, because of COVID, you know, providers have, uh, there may there may be fewer providers, so we're struggling to get back up to kind of pre-COVID access. So why don't we, why don't we start with that, which is, um, let, let's give some criteria to what we would do, uh, what we want to do around this community piece. Is it learn more information from the communities and, um, and then find out where there's alignment at the state level or, or what makes sense to folks when you look at that priority? Now, what, what should the role of the council be in this community piece? I guess is the overarching question. Yeah. Um, this, I think it piggybacks off of what April said. I would love to know, so for example, looking at number four, expand the reach of programs and services available. Um, 
for those people who prioritize that, is it already being done where you are and, and how is it being done? Is it private public partnerships? Is it the grants? Is it, I mean, how are, that's such a broad term, expand the reach. So how is that being done? Or is it not being done and that's what you want to see done? I think it would be helpful to hear how people are viewing these somehow. I mean, I think there's a question too, and I can't remember, I'm gonna admit what's in the needs assessment, but um, how do, you know, how do we measure whether uh, kids are, kids and families are, um, don't just have access, but are utilizing the programs that exist? You know, do we know whether capacity is, is being met or what the capacity gap is? So we have some of that information that could certainly be uh, highlighted again, and there may be, I'm sure each agency has been updating that since this document was produced, so that, that could be something that we could try to highlight is uh, where are the capacity gaps and how are those measured by different programs and services? What about, um, wh what else on that point about uh, about access and scaling up. What other questions do you think, or what other steps do you think the council could take to help that one move forward? I'm not, this is Kim. I'm not sure how much, like, where the council's role is in there, but one of the questions I've had on my mind, especially since COVID, is how have our Child care deserts changed, um, or um, you know, have the where have the deserts gotten bigger? Um, have they shifted? Like, is it like, and we, you know, I can I can pull a report from licensing and see, you know, we're still about thirty percent lost from where we were before COVID, but it doesn't tell me like where those. I, mean, I, I haven't dug in. I guess it does tell me if I did the data, but to dug in to really know where those holes are, how that. You know, so that's that's a concern on mine is do our suburban areas that we never have had a child care desert before, are they still okay? Or do we now have deserts there that weren't there before? Um, I feel like that's also a question about uh, pre-K too, which is I think we know that there's been drop off in enrollment, but, uh, and I'm sure TEA is, uh, you know, as they get enrollment numbers in regularly, that might be something that would be helpful to learn later is maybe are those more extreme in some communities? Obviously, I'm sure all districts are doing all the outreach they possibly can, but that might be helpful to know too. And uh, along with that, that would go along with the Texas Rising Star situation because that has been, a, I think, has been a problem is that there's not enough of the higher level, star level child care centers, uh, early learning centers, for when people want to partner with a public school because there are not enough of those. And so those two go hand in hand. So especially when after, after COVID or whatever and things ramp back up again, that you would have to, that those two, I think, are, are paired, I think because we need more uh, Texas Rising Stars, because that's one of the qualifications, isn't it, in order to partner with the public schools, that you have at least a three or four star center. And if we don't have that, then, then it's hard to have those partnerships, especially for districts who can't uh, accommodate those little children within their district. So that's a related issue. Okay, thank you, Ricky. Can I add to that? I, I think that the Texas Workforce Commission and the um, collaboration between agencies has done a really amazing job launching that child care website. Um, could we get a report as part of one of these meetings to learn more about what they're learning about, um, you know, child care deserts and these issues? So to add on that from the community perspective, there are some communities, I know Tarrant County and Austin 
and probably Dallas to have done their own trackers of capacity and utilization. So that might be an opportunity for us to, uh, you know, hear locally about what they've found. not just to locally what they found, but how did they find it? Right. What, what do they have in place that we can potentially duplicate across other communities? You know, if Lubbock wants to fight, figure it out, what do they right. need in well, place to be able to do that? And what have they done, you know, to right. try to support, to try to uh, help families, you know, get them something? Yeah. Right. role, you know, because some of this stuff we can't physically do because it has to do with the what's happening in the community, but our, we can do the behind the scenes research on this to move things forward because we have the people in the different areas across the state and we all have connections and stuff like that. And I think just this knowledge, bringing together knowledge from these different perspectives and groups and areas can be very helpful, and it's something that we can do as a as a uh, Texas Early Learning Council, I think. One of the things I think about, too, in terms of how do we tackle, of course, expanding the reach of programs um, is, a, is a great goal. Um, so understanding, like, what are the current barriers to doing that and how do we start breaking down or addressing those barriers and some of that information is identified in the needs assessment and plan but knowing from folks in terms of your community what are some of the barriers um, to broader reach and what are some things that the council might be able to address to remove any of those barriers So today, this is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sarah, Sarah, go ahead. Go, well, I was going to say, this is Reagan. To Dana's point, would it be helpful if we could try to um, invite some community folks who have been trying to build um, models across programs to get their input to understand where the challenges are? Mm -hmm. This is Sarah. I think what I was going to say was very aligned with that, Reagan. But it was it was more about would it make sense to create sort of an, a between meeting assignment for members of the council with some structured questions that we could send sort of we could serve a little bit as ambassadors for gathering that information from community providers or even um, families, depending on you know depending on each council member's specific sort of areas of connection and expertise that um, that we can really use the um, connections of this council to say, let's do a little bit of specific asking about some of the questions that have come up in this conversation. And when we come back together to be able to, or even in the interim to be able to share sort of what we've learned, because I agree that answering the question of what is it that what can we learn from that community voice is really has to be integrated with whatever solutions we recommend or whatever things we're learning. And so um, without the resources to do another big kind of needs assessment, but really to, to use the um, connections of this council to do a little outreach seems doable over the course of the next couple of months, I think. With some I mean, support and structure. Uh, yeah, and to, to build on that, there it seems like we could ask some questions of folks that are, you know, about what they're doing to, you know, figure out whether they are reaching families that need support, and and then what state support or information they've gotten that have helped that's helped them, and you know what else. Uh, you know, because there could be maybe the child care website, for example, was, you know, a big uh, help to them to, to think about who who was participating, who was open, you know, who needed support, um, just as an example. And then, uh, you know, what other information 
they need or other support. That, those could be some questions. Because it would it would be helpful to find out, I think, even for for us, like what what are the state programs and the way the money flows um, that's been super helpful so we can continue it. Or data, you know, what data has been useful? Yeah, that's a great question. So, Jerlisa, you you participate in ELA in Tarrant County, and are amongst a group of um, you know child care leaders who uh, are organizing, you know, and uh, serving families that aren't served elsewhere. Do you have some thoughts about, you know, what kind of community information could be elevated to the council and what you think would be helpful to, to uh, push back out? Yeah, I'm thinking that I can get with um, the chairperson of ELA to see if they will love to, I, I'm sure they would like to come and present on all the different things that they're doing and how we're doing it here in um, Tarrant County. So, t well, t yeah, Tarrant and Dallas County kind of, but yeah. mostly Tarrant. So I can get with um, Michelle and to see if she would like to come, um, present at the next, our next meeting or um, send some information over. Okay. Well, we'll keep track of that. This is things that can happen. Yes. Because they're doing a lot um, here. It's so much, so I have to get with her. To, um, like to get the, the details, but we would love to share what we're doing here in the Tarrant County area. And this is Reagan. I think that would be great to hear from them. I'm also really interested um, if we could come up with some um, some questions that the members could take back and gather input on. Um, I see in the chat, Kim, you were asking about, you know, what have we been able to collect and not collect um, with the website? Kirsten, I believe you, you're, you're talking about the um, the website that was the, the frontline website that was initially developed. It's now the Texas yeah. website. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and I'll tell you that our uh, TWC has approved funding to continue that online availability portal. Um, but but we're really interested in getting feedback on what's working with it. If people aren't using it, would they use it under different circumstances? Uh, because if we want to fund this, we want to make sure that it's a value um, mm -hmm. out in the community. Um, hey, Reagan, that's a good point. Um, just this morning on a news feed on a group on Facebook of providers in the Tarrant and surrounding areas, someone asked the question is, hey, has anyone received children from off the portal? And an overwhelming response of them said no, and that they were disappointed because they did not receive children from the portal. Um, and so I'm thinking maybe it would be a good idea to maybe ask actual practitioners, um, like in a forum like this, what what are, what are they getting from the website, and what do they need? Yes, I think that would yeah. be great. And really, so that is exactly what uh, those are the kinds of questions we're working with the Texas Policy Lab right now uh, out of Rice okay. University. They're conducting an extensive survey, one-on-one um, -on -one actually, with a lot of child care um, programs and may, may pull them into a focus group afterwards. But uh, we've also been receiving um, a record amount of emails from parents to this uh, email address we have associated with the portal of parents, um, you know, asking various questions about, okay, but I found this provider or that provider. And so they, we know from parents' side that they are finding providers, but it just may not always be clear on the other end to providers. So what can we do to make that connection more clear is also a good point. Yes. Thank you, Julie. That's a great suggestion. I mean, there's also a number of, you know, Text Protect uh, provided a public comment about Family Connects, and there's a couple of communities where there are evaluations happening. So that might be information that we'd want to go through a little bit uh, 
deeper because that's, that's, that's those are new programs in Texas. Um, that's one thought. The other is um, uh, you know pre-K for SA. I've been doing evaluations of their programs, so that might be something you know we might want to learn about as well as an option. Um, April, I um, I'm always fascinated with all the stuff that CLI is doing, and um, I know we had conversations as a group, you know, when we did the strategic plan where we talked a lot about social emotional health, you know, well-being, and you know, you have some uh, screeners for that that I guess some districts are using. It might be I'd be really interested to know sort of how how districts are using that and what they're finding, um, and especially in these times of COVID, so that I don't know how quickly you get that information from districts, but I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you all are already talking about things that are very time sensitive related to COVID that, that feels appropriate for us. Because the more information we have about sort of children's health and well-being now, you know, we can try to think about the solutions, but go ahead, April. I was going to say I'd be happy to share the data is available pretty immediately uh, to share like at an aggregate level and we've been really I mean the data collection is still pretty intense I think we wondered with COVID if there would be a, a pretty serious decline in the, the rate of sort of monitoring and assessment but we haven't really seen that which I'm sure is connected to TEA's guidance to keep keep going um, but yeah, I would be happy to share that. And you know, you mentioning data, I'm, I've been sitting here trying to write down like how would we flip some of these strategies into like a specific question or ask of a community member or organization. And data is really at the center of all of them. Like I think we'd want to solicit stories and examples where they've got some good data to share about how things are going, either how they identify their needs or how they are measuring their success. Both would be amazing, but maybe that'd be one way to sort of think about, um, like if we wanted to essentially, it seems like one of the things we could do is just start with learning more about how people have succeeded or the needs that have been identified in each of these areas. And I think their data stories are probably very informative. Yeah. And some of them would be really concrete to learn more about, like. Number three, develop and disseminate information. I mean, that's really sort of soliciting through all of our networks and contacts for success stories about how people have run a targeted outreach campaign around state learning standards, you know, and it could be a variety of standards uh, that are the subject of it, but we would want to learn more about the process for how they successfully targeted that campaign and designed it. That's what I would expect we could contribute with some learning around the, the process. Can I add to that, Ms. Kirsten? Um, there also has been some interesting research about English language learners, and I wonder if that might also contribute here, that, that those, that might be, there might be some unique needs um, for English language learners that we want to um, address or just better understand. And Kirsten, I'll just chime in and say that we have worked with uh, an advisory group um, and kind of broader stakeholder input and are drafting a policy roadmap on um, young English language learners, emergent bilinguals, um, and that should be out, well, I don't know, before session. But there's definitely issues in there about what data are available and what is, what, what's not available. So that may be uh, some things that, that would be useful for the council to know. I mean, I'm also thinking, Travis, and Travis, I'm going to punt it to you for a second, is that, you know, there's a lot of conversation about the COVID slide, um, and a lot of people are talking about a third grade reading, but, you know, there's not been a lot of discussion about what it means for early childhood and how that would be measured. Um, it's not just in attendance, but obviously, you know, pre-K programs, you know, the remote, I don't think we've ever, we've had a measure for what a quality remote early childhood program is like and if it's going to produce the same outcomes, of course. So maybe 
maybe there could be some questions about how we would know if there's a COVID slide in early childhood and what we'd want, what kind of data we'd want to gather. I don't know what you're working on that kind of at the district level. What do you, what do you think? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, well, we've seen this year and to try to um, summarize with our Head Start program, and we have three, three and four year olds. Um, we've seen a decline, of course, you know, a decline in enrollment. And a lot, we've offered the um, virtual option as well as the face to face option. Uh, in North Texas, there's a lot of rural districts that have, um, you know, made these announcements of we're, we're discontinuing to offer. Um, remote learning and things like that. Um, our superintendent, uh, thank God, has his head on straight. And he said, we are gonna continue to offer the remote option or face-to-face -face option for families because we need to do what's best for families. So it, it's been good to let parents have that option. I will say it's been uh, an immense struggle for early childhood educators to sort of flip a switch to go from face-to-face -face instruction to um, remote instruction or having kids that are a combination. For example, if a given teacher has seven children in front of her face, you know, and then she's got seven at home at the same, uh, the, that blending learning style, um, albeit asynchronous, and they're kind of doing it on their own time. Uh, overwhelmingly, we've seen a lot of our students that are participating via remote instruction struggling. And um, some are being supervised by older siblings. Um, uh, some, some are being supervised by an aunt or a grandpa or grandma. Um, so it's been a it's been a huge struggle uh, to have our to get our remote students um, up to par. Uh, the so Stephanie, when you talk about the um, as far as the data piece goes with COVID slide, you know, of course we have attendance data and things like that, but um, the cir circle assessment is the progress monitoring that's given beginning, beginning, middle, and end of year um, in Texas Kia for kindergarten. And there's different, different instruments, different school districts. Um, but that's been telling too, because we've, that matches what, it's been consistent that remote, our remote students overall um, unless they have a good, strong support network at home and they have a parent that's that's by their side and helping them log in, you know, get the work completed, um, coordinate with the teacher, it's been um, pretty disastrous. <laughs> I'm just kind of being honest. Um, and if they have broadband, yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am, yeah, internet issues. Or, or, yeah, or enough for the whole family to use it, you know, or enough devices. Right. So. Yeah, and what's been difficult too, a lot of our parents, a three-year-old parents at Head Start uh, enrolled and did the, you know, if they weren't comfortable sending their child physically to school, they did the remote option. Um, and then a lot of them started withdrawing saying, but, and I'm, they, the, the child care component's missing, you know, so they, they're saying it's not worth it to me to participate remotely. We're just going to withdraw. And so, um, we're, we're fighting the battle, but uh, and we're, we're coordinating with our child care centers here locally. Um, just within the last week in our area, several of them announced that they'd be closing from the Thanksgiving break through question mark, you know, um, because of staff getting sick. So we're seeing a lot of our kids staying pretty healthy in the early childhood realm, but our staff members, you know, dropping. And um, that's been the challenge. I don't know if I answered your question. Did I answer your question? Um, Stephanie, yeah, yeah. Uh, one, one last thing I'll throw out. I'm so sorry. I don't want to jeopardize the time. Uh, okay. uh, through, through TEA, um, we applied for, it's called ADSY, Additional Days School Year, I believe. And there's a voluntary summer learning cohort. Um, and we were, we were, we were accepted, and so we received the, the grant to offer a summer learning program, which we're very excited about, uh, because traditionally in the past, you know, summer opportunities are more for students that weren't successful, you know, on the STAR test, a state assessment, 
um, but this is the polar opposite. So it's going to be open to children that are experiencing COVID slide, but it's going to be more, more, more of an enrichment opportunity. Um, and so that's something that's beneficial to our district specifically. Now, not every district, you know, applied, um, but that's something we are excited about. May I ask a question about that, Stephanie? Do you mind? No, of course. Um, so, Travis, you must have been reading my mind because I was going to ask if anyone knew of any remediation programs that were in the works. But my question is, is that going to be in person? Is the plan to have your, that program in person, A? And B, gosh, I wish they could make it mandatory and not voluntary. Well, good question. We're We're in the development phase and what's been very nice, uh, TEA has been a huge help in facilitating this and coordinating with us. Um, uh, our hope and prayer is that it's going that it will be face to face. Um, the federal federal programs director and a, and a group of educators, parents from the community um, and our teachers and a few administrators and kind of a mixed bag uh is on the committee and we hope and pray we can offer it face to face um it, that's our primary goal is to be able to offer it face to face and it, rem offering it remote is kind of a fuzzy question mark at this point um because we're just not sure what covid will look like at that point and we're hoping and praying that we're able to so we're plan uh dr Abbott, we're planning face to face um, we're hoping and praying that that will work out. Um, and then, you know, the plan for now is to offer it as an optional opportunity, but to um, identify children who are struggling and who, who have performed poorly throughout the school year um, and strongly encourage uh, them to attend. So, but not, not, not make it mandatory. Um, but I, I understand your point. We we are we are definitely seeing COVID slide from children being at home um, a, a large part of last spring. So maybe one thing as I hear you um, talk about school uh, context, and then you know April's uh, you know circle is obviously in lots of. Uh, you know, other contexts too. And it just makes me wonder whether it would be helpful for the council to gather information from communities uh, or from, you know, to see whether the state is collecting information from communities that would shed light on the extent to which there is a COVID slide academically, mental, you know, in terms of mental health or other well-being for uh, young kids. Um, or, you know, the scope of our years in the Early Learning Council and sort of how, how that data has been collected and measured, so how they know. I mean, Head Start may be, uh, you know, collecting that in one way, child care programs, maybe Circle is the way that they're finding that out. Um, I know ECI programs have, you know, seen, uh, have managed to keep families enrolled through telehealth, but that was a pivot that they made. But they're made, you know, they they may be seeing signs of family stress on kids, you know, and affecting development. But it might be interesting for us to figure out how that, uh, what kind of information is out there and what we don't know. Because I think when generally people are talking about COVID slide publicly, they're talking about more K-12 kids, I think. Yeah, uh, Stephanie, that is a great point, and um, and I think you've made this point before. But uh, we're good at collecting data within silos, but then collectively and, and as a community, that's that's the that's the hard part. Um, and you're right, the COVID slide. I think yeah, K-12 and and um, not so much um, at pre-K or Head Start when families can, uh, you know, the three and four year old years where families can just say, we're not going to, we're not coming this year, you know, we'll come show up at kindergarten, you know. So. Kim also has the ability to do a survey of early childhood people about 
what they're seeing in early childhood centers. So that may be another avenue. Uh, is yeah. the they do an annual survey? So. Uh, and then we also will have, Macy's just has a survey out currently. Um, I think they've extended the deadline for that for child care for through, I think, next Sunday, so Sunday after Thanksgiving. Um, so we'll have that data, too, hopefully in another month or so um, to look at. That's more about how the businesses are surviving, not so much um, what they're seeing for their students. Stephanie? Yes. Yeah. April, April has lost her internet connection, but she sent me a message to share that uh, CLI can share trends from screening and progress monitoring. Great. That's wonderful. Yeah, it could be that um, the communities we talked about, like Tarrant and Houston and Austin, are doing some other kind of data collection around uh, these same kinds of issues. So maybe there could be. Uh, we could figure out a way to collect them all so they're available to some degree. Any other thoughts? One one thing just uh, subjectively that's specific to uh, the schools, but also our some of our child care centers here locally is um, the uh, and this is not a kind of a whiny comment, just kind of a uh, straight up. Uh, a lot of our a lot of principals and assistant principals, you know, their their comment has been they've had to spend so much time trying to get substitute teachers for staff members that have been quarantined or that uh, are waiting on test results or whatever um, that uh, they really feel like. You know, their attention to appraise teachers or support teachers um, has been difficult and, you know, has been limited. So uh, I would agree with that, that that there's COVID has caused so much damage that it's hard to, um, there, there's going to be an academic and an instructional loss, not just from last spring, but from this entire school year, I think, um, based on what, based on how the fall semester has gone so far, and um, I, although I really, you know, I really feel bad for child care centers because when when you have a staff of, um, and and one of the child care folks can weigh on, weigh in on this, Julie, or someone else that that has more knowledge, but you know when they have a staff of eight to ten people and six or seven of them are quarantined, they can't they cannot operate. There's not enough healthy adults to to physically to run the center. So that's that's been um, hard. The other thing I was thinking about in terms of signs that kids might be, uh, young kids might be struggling are things around food insecurity and, you know, districts stepping up with more meals and what, uh, you know, we don't, uh, so that's one thing. And then the other is, uh, you know, going to well checks, uh, you know, whether they're seeing their you know, primary care physicians. And it, it, it strikes me, you know, we don't, I don't think we have somebody on the council who's from HHSC Medicaid, um, but maybe we could have somebody come and talk a little bit about that. Cause I, I know we've heard from ECI providers, for example, that, you know, they're not getting as many referrals from pediatricians because the kids aren't, aren't going um, as often. So they're well checked so that, that there's a sort of downstream impact of that. And then the same on, uh, you know, Amber and I were in a discussion recently around school readiness, and people really talked about one thing to measure as to whether kids are ready to uh, and able to learn as to whether they're hungry. And so uh, we know schools have truly really tried to step up, but there may be there may be good data about out there about how many more families, you know, need food or need food, you know, over the weekends and over the holidays and things like that that may not have been the role of uh, districts before, or child care for that matter. And one thing I like about this council is it's not just about instruction and your academic way of thinking about it for young kids. We're thinking about the kind of holistic child. So. To go off of what Travis was talking about, um, 
teachers and how the one, if one gets it, then, you know, it's hard to function with limited staff, but um, also to include the massive cleaning that we have to do every day. Um, we were talking about coming back to work and what everybody's role is going to be. Um, uh, the school has put us at a 25% um, capacity. So our numbers have gone down drastically. We went from 53 kids to 14 kids. And then our staff, we're trying to figure out how to staff. Well, we can only have so many people on a floor at a certain time, um, but we have to be able to still provide care for um, the parents and the students. And the logistics are getting difficult because you still have um, families and um, teachers that are saying that they can't come in because they are in a high risk group. So you, we've already lost some teachers that way. And now we have teachers once they get sick or, you know, how the rotation, how to do it. So there's a lot to go on just trying to think about trying to get started because we, we, we closed the college closed us down. It wasn't a. A question for us, whether we could or not, they said, this is what's happening. Um, but to, to try to just get back on our feet, we're learning from all the different centers um, that we meet up with and share and, uh, you know, everybody's kind of struggling, trying to get things done and and how do you have morale and mental health for the teachers? Because they come in and. Well, you now you're only just one teacher in your room, but when you go to lunch, you can't eat lunch with the other teachers because if somebody gets it, then they all get it and then you have to close the whole center. So there's a lot of uh, mental health and stress for the teachers. And then, you know, when you go into your classroom, you have to make sure that you leave that at the door. So I think there's a lot going on just to open a classroom. So that strikes me as it potentially fitting in this category of, uh, you know, quality early learning experience is if you have a lot of turnover, you have very, uh, you know, stressed out educators, uh, then it's, you know, it's difficult for kids to have a consistent adult there watching over them and, you know, who's uh, able to nurture them, you know, who's in a place to do that. And that's, that doesn't fit your typical quality indicator that we might have in any of our programs, but but, uh, but that's a sign of a challenge in the quality side of things, of what kids are experiencing. And I will also say, um, to piggyback on what um, she just said, not only mental health, but health care. Um, a lot of providers don't have health insurance. And so once they're sick, they're sick. So how do they take care of themselves? How can they go to the doctor if they don't have health insurance? Or how can they afford to pay a clinic or something, even if it's a low fee, they don't have any money because they're not working and they can't get paid, you know? So it's like a, when COVID hits the center, it's like a domino effect. I know four centers personally that are closed right now because of COVID, because um, they have COVID cases in their classroom. And those providers, the teachers are struggling, the staff is struggling, and some might not even reopen. So it's just like a whole circle of things. So. I just have to say that. So it's like, what do we do? Yeah. And Stephanie, it's Reagan. I did want to bring up on the food insecurity issue. Um, and I'm, I'll, I probably have to have Shay help me answer this question. There was an expansion in the recent some recent congressional legislation that, that expanded some of the COVID food program eligibility into child care. And I understand that there have been meetings that have been happening between um, Shea, who was at HHSC, and some people about potential implementation. So it would be interesting to know if everybody on the council is aware of that. No, that would be a great update to give. I don't think so. Okay, we can add that to our list. Yes, it's um, HHSC and some others. Excuse me, Shay, can you let April back in, please? Yes.
Thank you. Welcome, April. Welcome back. We just assigned a bunch of work to you. I hope you don't cry. I was just going to say that, Stephanie. Who's going to break it to her? That she's Kim, Kim and I have the same. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. So, are there any other? Um, I hope, hope I don't. I don't feel like we've gotten off track because we've talked about the important stuff. But let's just circle back to the agenda item <laughs> about what uh, what you might want to know and what the council could do around some of the community pieces. Is there anything we didn't touch on? Um, that you wanted to bring up. We talked about we talked about food insecurity. We talked about children's mental health. We talked about uh, enrollment in programs. We talked about um, the, you know what whether kids are 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 learning what they're supposed to in a remote environment in a developmentally appropriate way. I'll put that caveat on there. Um, things having to do with child, you know, who's open and who's who's closed, um, and learning a little bit more about why. Um, and uh, and I appreciate Teresa's comments about how difficult it is to be, you know, an educator right now. Um, and then April talked a little bit about uh, the screening information that she has access to. That would be wonderful. Um, Stephanie, this is it's Sarah. I think just to hop on to the um, what April was talking about, just in terms of screening information, is I'll just say that that we've definitely seen challenges in our home visiting world around um, around screenings and other kinds of assessments that folks are used to doing in person. And so, for sure, there's been some challenges around implementing developmental screenings in, in the way that folks would like to, but I would say also things like maternal depression screening and um, in intimate partner violence screening, which are just things that often are, are actually um, like uh, that experts will tell us is not a good idea to do virtually or in these that there there has to be, we have, we have to do more than just pivot to doing the same screening on Zoom. We have to manage the assessment in a totally different way, and we just haven't yet been able to pivot fast enough to do that in a way that feels like we're addressing the need or assessing the need. And so I would definitely be interested in hearing from council members if they've had experience or interest or how that is, how that how that connection. I feel like in so many ways, in every part of the early childhood world, some of what we're doing is trying to help families get connected because as we as we heard from our public comments at the beginning, there isn't like a single place. There's not a, thing, a centralized place where families with young kids go to get what they need. And so part of what every early childhood program or service or information source is doing is trying to help families identify what they need and connect them to the right resources. And that just is, feels like, and what we've heard from communities is infinitely harder as we pivot towards this more virtual support space. Well, that's a great point. And we may be missing families or it may be even that much more challenging given linguistic issues, so. Sarah, I don't know if it would be helpful at all, but. I mean, I'd be happy to sort of gather information and perspectives from the developmental pediatricians and child psychologists that we're working with. Um, you know, all of our clinical operations have shifted to telehealth. Now we're sort of right. seeing people back home. Um, but it, that was a huge issue, is what can you and can't you actually achieve from a screening and right. testing diagnostic perspective in this sort of virtual model? Um, so I don't know. To the extent it would be helpful, I'm happy to. Yeah. You know, tell Well, and I think it would be helpful to share with sort of our early childhood community what what is possible. Like it is, yeah. we may some of the lessons learned may be there are things that are not possible to do virtually, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. um, and sort of having some space to say these are. These are things that we need to tackle in a different way. We can't just, um, 
I think about it in terms of places where we've just translated something from one language to another um, and and just translating it word by word into a different language doesn't compute the it doesn't the meaning isn't doesn't come with the translation and I feel like that's happened in some of our virtual pivots. I think our providers have been like absolute heroes in trying to figure out how to pivot quickly to connect with families online and yet there are these big chunks of things that um, that aren't translatable into an online yeah. virtual world and um, and I think we haven't really been articulate about which are those things that are not translatable and then how to how what to do instead. Yeah, no, I, that's what I'm hearing too. Like I know they've been favoring a lot of the more kind of play-based interactions where they can facilitate sort of through the, the parent, um, you know, or through the adult the types of interactions that they need to do their, their assessment work around. So, yeah, I agree. I think we all really figured out how to use Zoom and WebEx and all yeah. these technologies very quickly. And then it was like, oh, and what do we do now that we're on? <laughs> now that we're online and we're doing this thing, how do we do it well? Yeah. Thank you for that, Sarah. That's great. Any other thoughts? Um, I know we have a long list now of things. Um, see, we started with number five, like, what are we going to do? But, but now we have a good list. Anything so else? Stephanie, what do we do uh, with this, this list is, now? I, oh. I was just saying that, you know, some of these things, because of COVID and all the things that are happening with child development centers and things like that, things like, uh, getting into the Texas Rising Star is not the top priority right now. I mean, they can't ha actually probably handle doing a big application for <clears throat> Texas Rising Star. It's like the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, right now it's just staying alive. You know, that's on staying alive, staying alive. That's all people can do. And at least I know that's what it's like even at the university level. All I do is get through the semester. Probably Kathy's the same way. And then some of these other things are really aspirational, and we would love if we hadn't had COVID, it would be great to do. But I think we need to start where the real need is right now and then go from there and know that some of these other things are great, but we can't, it's not going to happen until we're meeting the needs of the people in the field, in the, you know, on the, in the trenches. Um, that's my thought. I mean, the other thing I would say, um, and related to Sarah's comments, because she brought up uh, maternal mental health, I think, is that it's for us to think about what kind of data we would want or information that's the, that's, that's the two-gen stuff, right? How parents are doing, uh, because that's going to translate into how well kids are doing. So maybe we can think about that and share uh, some suggestions of you know, over time of what kind of data or information that the state's collecting or the communities are collecting to show uh, that two-gen challenge. April, did you have yeah. a comment? Uh, I, was, I think that's super important, the two-generation lens on this. I was going to also say that thinking about child care and early childhood education professionals, we are using the Texas um, early Childhood Professional Development System to repeat a survey throughout this kind of COVID-19 period to learn more about um, what directors and teachers in centers say they need and what trainers are saying about how things are on the ground right now and what they need uh, in terms of training and support. And then we've embedded some stress-related questions just to learn more about how they're doing. Um, so that's another source of data that, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to summarize that information and share it with the council. And the other issue that's getting a lot of discussion that would probably not have been on our radar pre-COVID is, um, you know, access to technology and broadband. Um, and so, and we don't, I haven't heard a lot of discussion about whether families with, I mean, we've talked about school age kids really more than anything in the, in the public sphere. 
but when we uh, refer to things like, you know, when we need screenings, when we need telehealth, when we need, um, you know, other things that families are now accessing, if they are, uh, or other family engagement efforts in general with all our programs, it's a question about whether they have sufficient internet access, technological knowledge, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and other things. So that may be something, I don't know who's collecting that information with that TEA, but I wonder whether the other agencies that have programs for young kids are trying to collect that information about, uh, you, know, you know, technology access. And, and one reason why that might be important, actually, is that, um, you know, CARES Act funding has been used for remote learning and technology, and, uh, and you know, there may be another stimulus package with more CARES Act money, and, and, and there's another federal source, GEERS, G-E-E-R-S. Uh, but it strikes me that I don't know if we have enough information about how early childhood programs and how families with young kids, you know, whether there's a lot of need there and for what in particular, because if we do have federal funding coming through the state that can be used for that purpose, you know, we may want to highlight where the needs might be. Well, that might be something that could be part of a, a separate work group that's happening as early childhood education business collaboratory with some of the folks on this call, Kim Cochran and Reagan Miller and myself are part of this, uh, and Julie Richards, um, so most, most of the group is represented on this call, are part of a, another um, work group around that, and that may be something that we build into plans if, if a survey comes up as um, something that's doable. But I did want to just also hop in and say we have about um, eight to ten minutes left for this part of the discussion, Stephanie, before adjournment. Before moving to yes, adjournment and discussion of future yeah. meeting dates. Yeah. Thank you for that, Shay. That's great. Uh, Stephanie, this is Kirsten. Can I add to that just really quickly? Um, in our work, when we work with centers, we find that there's a, a lack of technology within centers. And of course, um, that also exists for um, family, friends, and neighbors. So it would be, you know, I think it would be helpful. Um, I think most of the data TEA collects is about pre-K um, or, you know, three- and four-year-old um, technology access. So I think it would it would be helpful to have some work, you know, some agencies looking at um, the access that um, child care centers have as well as um, uh, home um, work for, um, other, you know, registered providers. Yeah, and what the state has been able to do so far, like I know, you know, Dana led an effort to make sure that, you know, there was technology in the hands of ECI providers and that they had e-signature e software and things like that to do the HIPAA required consents and things like that. So, yeah, that I think that's a great idea. And also, you know, Broadband and Technology Act is going to be a big discussion point this next session as one of the top of mind issues. So I think, you know, if the council can help elevate what the needs of early childhood are, that, that's informative for them, for the, for the policy leaders. Okay, I just so wanna, any I other ask, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, when you mentioned broadband, um, uh, two providers reached out to me the other day, and, you know, with, they have a lot of schoolers now, and so some of the schoolers have hot spots, but not all. They may forget it or whatever, and so the schoolers that need to use the, um, the center's Wi-Fi, they can't really because it goes so slow, so they can't get their work done. So I just wanted to add that when you said broadband. I can't mind. Yeah. There's the quality of that kind of access too, right? Thank you, Julissa. Okay, so I think we have um, we have discussed a lot of uh, information that we want to gather, and some of that is action items. And uh, so I appreciate everyone's input um, on that discussion item and the survey. So thank you. Um, are we ready to move on to the next agenda item? Do you think, Shay? Sure. Okay, great. So. Yes. So, yeah, so the last piece is our schedule. 
And just so folks know, um, we are going to cancel the December meeting. Um, and uh, I think we have some tentative dates for 2021. Maybe Shay, you have shared those, or maybe you have those. Um, yes, I just shared my screen um, so folks can see them here. I can read them aloud if that's helpful. Sure, go um, ahead. For those on the phone and who may not be able to see this, the uh, proposed 2021 meeting dates um, all being Fridays, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, this would change the meeting to every other month. So January 15th, March 19th, May 21st, July 16th, September 17th, and November 19th for 2021. I'm sure everyone knows what they're doing November 19th, 2021, so you can comment on the page <laughs> now. But but anyway, the, the, I think the point is that, uh, you know, every other month, and we're going to try to stick to the Friday schedule, and for the time being, of course, we're going to continue with WebEx and hope that sooner rather than later, there will be health and safety that allows us to get back together in person, but we're not there yet. Um, everyone, uh, we, you know, we, and we can send you those dates. You did not have to scribble them down at this moment, but we did want to make that announcement. Hey, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie you joke yeah. about November 19th, um, but if all it is goes as planned, that is NACI's annual conference. So there may be several of us in, hopefully, in Orlando. Woo! So, so right. I mean, fingers crossed. So. Okay, so we'll we'll think about that date. Okay. Um, I also wanted to mention. I just looked, and um, at least for those of us in Austin, on March 19th, that is during AISD's scheduled spring break. That's true. So if there are folks who might be off with their little one. Note taken. Yeah. Okay, we'll think about that day too. Anything else uh, pop out at you? Obviously, we know our state agency folks, um, well, sometimes get called into hearings and things during session, but not usually Fridays. So. Uh, but it, we're getting upon the busy time. Anything else on um, schedule? And then I think we're almost ready to adjourn. Could we be done early? Is that possible? Shay or, or Reagan, anything else? Or any other members? I don't have uh, anything else. Just. Uh, an eye out for January 15th is the next meeting date, um, and we will be sending members and the public information on that. Um, Reagan? Yeah, I, I'll just say um, I was really glad to hear all the data talk because although the um, the strategies on data didn't float to the top, I'd actually voted on those because <laughs> I thought this is an area that the council probably could provide a lot of, of input. Um, so I was just really glad to hear all of the talk on data. So. And thank you, Stephanie, for leading us through another good meeting. Yes, yeah. thanks to everybody. I know everybody's busy and another two hour uh, meeting on WebEx, no less, is not anyone's favorite thing to do, but it's great to see everybody. Thank you, stay well and healthy. I think, I don't think we need a vote to adjourn. I think I, I might have the power to adjourn us so I'm going to do that with a smile and uh, tell everybody to have a good weekend, and we will be back with you soon. Okay? Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Hey, okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Bye. Bye.